Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Giovanna Scorsone. I'm the Education and Public Engagement Manager here at the Aga Khan Museum. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you here today for an afternoon of inspiration as we hear from Zarka Nawaz on the power of pop culture and the arts to change our perceptions of those around us and to drive social good. We at the Aga Khan Museum believe that art is an entry point for connecting people. Whether it's ceramics and manuscripts of literature created in medieval Spain or Iran, or a popular TV show and humorous memoir created in the prairies of Canada, art has the power to provide a glimpse of a person, the artist that created it, and the context in which it came to be. And from there, it can provide a bridge to cultural understanding, respect, and pluralism. As we gather here today, and in keeping with our museum's mission to use art and culture to promote pluralism and respect for diversity, we acknowledge the territory and the living diversity of Canada's first peoples in this land on which the Aga Khan Museum sits. Toronto, known as Takaronto, is in the dish with one spoon territory. The dish with one spoon territory is a treaty between the Anishinaabe, the Mississaugas, and the Haudenosaunee that bound them to share the territory and protect the land. Subsequent indigenous nations and peoples, Europeans and all newcomers, have been invited into this treaty in the spirit of peace, friendship and respect. Today we make space for, this, for us to consider that spirit of respect across cultures as we hear from Zarka about her experiences as a Canadian Muslim and as a woman and how they informed her career creating mainstream media, challenging the public narrative of life in Canada. Zarka has a Bachelor of Science from the University of Toronto, and after being rejected from medical school, she went on to create several short comedy films that focused on Muslim issues in Canada. When the National Film Board of Canada approached her to do something more serious, she was ready for it. Her 2005 groundbreaking documentary, Me in the Mosque, explored Muslim women's battle with patriarchy in the mosque. Her comedy hit, Little Mosque on the Prairie, ran on CBC television between 2007 and 2012. Most recently, she has written a best-selling comedic memoir, Laughing All the Way to the Mosque, which, in which she explores what it was like to grow up as a Canadian of Muslim faith. We also have some rare hardcover editions available in our shop, so if you do want to grab a copy and, and get Zarka to sign it at the end of the talk, th today's your chance. She's now a CBC television 6 o'clock news host. Uh, in Saskatchewan. But today we're very happy to welcome her here to the Aga Khan Museum. Please join me in welcoming Zarka to the podium. Thank you for welcoming me here today. It was such an incredible experience when I got the invitation to come to the Aga Khan Museum. It is such a beautiful place. We're having a very spirited discussion about alternate ways of raising money. And I was trying to convince um, the organizers that, you know, because there was a beautiful bride and she was walking around the, the gardens and I was thinking, you know what, you could market like some of the stuff you have in the museum, like the swords and the jewelry and all, you know, I mean, people would, like I find brides and grooms are getting crazier and crazier as the weddings progress. I mean, is it just me or are people spending more and more money? And I was like, if those swords have lasted 600 years, they can last another day. <laughs> so you'd loan them out to these young people who are trying to get married and, you know, charge the extra fee to pretend they're Mughal emperor for the day. And <laughs> That would be a great fundraiser for the place. They're thinking about it. I was thinking, you know, you could even have the carpets. You could use the carpets and as a backdrop, and then you can shampoo them and put them back. Right? Those are durable, durable things. But it was so great to be invited here and to, to be one of the only one of the the only place in North America which is dedicated to Islamic art and history, and to be able to speak to you as a Muslim woman about what my what, what my journey has been like. Um, as a daughter of immigrants. Speaking of which, my stalkers, or otherwise I know, um, know them as my parents, are here. <laughs> they live in Toronto and I live in Saskatchewan. Where are they? Can you wave on me? Are they around? Where are they? Oh, there they are. They're right there. <laughs> my embarrassed um, son is between them. <laughs> So I do, I, I just got a job as the six o'clock news host for, for the Saskatchewan News for, yes, yes. 
So if you guys want to, you know, double our ratings, just look us up on Facebook, and then we are live on Facebook at 6 o'clock if you have a deep, you know, uh, need to find out what's going on in Saskatchewan, which I think, you know, you guys should find out more what's happening in the other provinces of Canada. But I want to tell you how did I, first of all, how did I wind up in Saskatchewan, then how did I wind up in Toronto? And I, what I wanted to tell all of you is that my, if you, to really understand my story, you have to go back to 1947, and that was the year that the British decided to separate India. And for those who don't know, India was a, was a, a culture, was a community, was a country where Hindus and Muslims and Sikhs lived together, practicing their three religions and relative peace. And then there was a time when the British came and they used what they call divide and conquer, where they convinced the three groups that they couldn't live together, even though they had for centuries. They, you know, they accommodated one another's cultures and faith, they intermarried, they shared each other's food and clothing and land and homes and families. And then when the British came, they convinced the three groups that they were enemies and that they couldn't coexist. And the decision was made to separate India into two countries, Muslim Pakistan and Hindu India. And my father's side of the family lived in Ludhiana, which was in India, and they were Punjabi, and they lived with their Sikh neighbors in peace. But he said it was overnight. Suddenly, you were no longer safe. Your neighbors didn't trust each other, and the killing started, and they had to be removed from their homes. They lived in refugee camps until they could be transported to trains, and those trains migrated both ways. And it, at that time, I believe it was the largest human migration in history. And even some of those trains would be stopped and people would be slaughtered wholesale. So when those trains arrived, they would just be full of slaughtered people. And that was my, he was, my father was 15 when that journey from India to then Muslim Pakistan was made. And he was the eldest son in his family. And in that time period, the eldest son was the one who was culturally responsible for looking after the family financially. And so he felt that that had been such a tr traumatic experience in his life because what he had learned was at a very early age that everything can be taken from you. Land, family, money, everything that you had worked for for centuries could just be gone in a heartbeat and you're left with nothing. But the only thing that couldn't be taken away from you was education. So he started the process of becoming educated and he became an engineer because he had lots of brothers and sisters that were younger than him and they were going to be plunged into systemic poverty if they weren't able to find a way out because they had lost everything. So he became an engineer, a civil engineer, and ironically, the very country that had caused his family's plunge into poverty was the very same country that needed immigrants to help rebuild after World War II. So they were recruiting educated immigrants from Pakistan to go to England and have jobs. And that is why so many people moved from India and Pakistan. Their first route of migration was actually to the UK. And so he went to the UK and he was hired as a civil engineer. And for those of you who are familiar with the UK, have you heard of the Massey Tunnels? Has anyone heard of these big concrete? You have to ask my father because I don't quite understand what they are, but there were these tunnels. And he was in charge of the concrete testing and they were in Liverpool, England. So he was working for years in England, sending every penny he had back home to help raise his brothers and sisters, get them educated and get them married and get them on you know, with their lives. And so finally the villagers were like, you know, he's now in his 30s. And so they're asking, when will his turn to have a family happen? And his, his parents were like, look, he refuses to come home because he has a strong duty towards his family. We, we don't know what to do. He's considering himself as the person who's going to sacrifice his whole life for us. And so then one day he gets a telegram. And the telegram says that his father is dying and he has to come back home. So he rushes back home from Liverpool, England, just to be greeted by a band and a wedding and a shiny new bride. And that's the way they did it back then, right? <laughs> that was what they called hardcore arranged marriage. Not only did you not know your bride, you didn't even know you were getting married. And so, he, so back then, I guess the immigration process was very um, more fluid than it is today, because you could get married one day in Pakistan, and the next day you bring your bride back home. 
<laughs> and his family, you know, his friends are very surprised in Liverpool going, you know, how's your father? He's like, he's very well, it turned out it was a false alarm, but here's my new wife. And so this is, I think the wedding was so quick they didn't have time to take a picture. So when they went to Liverpool, this is their newlywed picture that they took, right? So this is what they look like 50 years ago. And there they are now if you want the after picture. <laughs> So that's how my father got married. So he was in Liverpool with my mom. And then a year later, I was born. <laughs> I'm cute, right? <laughs> my mom knit my hat. So I was the first of three children, but the only daughter. And when I talk about um, being the only daughter, my father when, it, when he went back home, he noticed that his female relatives had been married off early as teenagers because the custom and the culture back then was we have to protect our women and the easiest way to protect them was to get them married and in a family. But he always felt that if they had been allowed to become educated, they would become financially independent, have a job, make their own money, and then marriage would become a moot point because then that's only for women who fail in life, right? And so he became obsessed with this idea that if you educate a woman and you give her an education and she can make her own money, men, are, men become unne unnecessary. They're just like a waste of time for a woman. And he became obsessed with this idea so much so that whenever you know, a woman would come and visit our family, he would always ask, like, you know, what education do you have? And, and if she has a BSc, and he goes, well, why did you stop? And she goes, well, because I got married and had children. Or if she have a master's, well, why did you stop? And I get your PhD, well, because I got married and had children. If, you know, if she has a PhD, well, why didn't she become the head of the economic, you know, international fund? You know, he's like, oh, because I got married. And so that was, he's like, you know what? There's something going on here. Marriage and children are the death knell for women's careers. Thus, we will avoid it at any cost. <laughs> And so it was kind of weird. It was like being raised by a very conservative Muslim man who was channeling like a very radical Gloria Steinem, right? <laughs> so here I was, you know, men are terrible, babies are terrible, you must get an education and go to the top of your class. Become, and what would I, what would I become? What is the number one goal for every immigrant father? Doctor. So that was it. I was brainwashed from a very, very early age to go into medical school. And I totally drank the Kool-Aid. You know, whenever I would go to visit a doctor, my father would introduce us. He would have him come over for dinner. He would try to convince him to write my reference papers. And he's like, he's only in kindergarten. We should wait a little bit because... And so that, well, that was what my life was. You would become a doctor, and you would make a lot of money, and you'd be financially stable and successful, and we would never need men or babies in our lives, right? that would be fine. And so that was how I was raised. And I did really well in school, in high school I did really well, but then I hit university where I did my science degree. And that was when I couldn't summon up enough enthusiasm for like calculus and physics and stats and these things that they force you to take to get into medical school because you know they have medical school boards and they feel like they have to protect people like you from people like me. And the only way they can be sure that this person isn't really doing it because her father made her do it, <laughs> that she really wants to do it out of her own accord, is to have these really crazy classes, and then you have to do really well. But I started doing better in my like, philosophy class, and my English class, and I was like, I kind of enjoyed these classes more. They're more creative and fun, and I was not having a good time in these other classes, so I didn't really study that much, and then my mark started to fall. And then when I applied after four years, I didn't get in, you guys. <laughs> and it was huge shock, like because you are literally raised from an embryo with only one goal in your whole existence. And when it doesn't happen, you're like, oh no, because like, there was never, ever a plan B. There was never a second career option. There was like nothing. And so I was like, oh my god, I, I don't know what I'm going to do. Like I was so crushed and shocked i went in, you know i'm into this period of like depression and but my mother my mother was like wait i've all you know because she always had a plan b and now it was her chance and she goes we could get her married and so <laughs> <laughs> because she felt because as a woman who had gotten married she did not feel that her life had been a failure <laughs> when she, you know she also was an educated woman who who wasn't able to be a teacher because she had babies. But anyway, that's another question, <laughs> another issue. And so she said, you know, and in her time period, because of the way she had gotten married, was really the only way she knew how. But now, you know, people 
ask questions, like I want to see him, you know, I want to get to know him. So it was like, fine. So the next thing I knew, I'd, I would come home, you know, from work or school, and there would be this guy sitting in the living room. And I'm like, what's this? And mom said, well, you said you wanted to see him. And I'm like, no, that's, that's not what I meant, right? I mean, you know, get to know and talk, and, and she's like, he, it's fine. He, he's doing his PhD, and in two years, he'll be done, and then you can be a housewife in Karachi, because that's where he has to fulfill the government mandate, if you, you know, if they pay for your PhDs. And I was like, oh my God, if I didn't pull my life together, I was going to, you know, wind up as a housewife in Karachi. So, and then when I would say no, and that, you know, you'd think that would be over, but then another version would show up the next week, and after a while, I started just referring to them by their state, because for some reason, there's an unending sea of single eligible Pakistani men who are doing their PhDs in the United States, who are sponsored by the government, who just need a, you know, a, a citizenship with benefits, and then they can either stay or go back. And so I was like, this is, this is getting crazy. This is never going to end. So there's nothing like you know, imminent marital <laughs> um, happening to you to snap you out of your depression. And I'm like, OK, got to figure something out you know, really fast, or I'm going to you know, wind up being a housewife somewhere in Islamabad, making rotis for like 20 years. So then <laughs> the only school that still had, uh, that still was allowing applications, the deadline hadn't passed, was the Ryerson School for Journalism. And my best friend was like, listen, she was, you know, I, I went to an Islamic camp with her and Islamic conferences, and she was always writing poetry and writing films, and she wanted to write books. And, and somehow that career as an artist was that forbidden career, you know? The kind of things that good Muslim girls didn't do, like wear fishnet stockings or you know, wear lip gloss. We don't do those things. We don't go into the forbidden arts. Those, that's like a world that no one had ever mentioned to us before as a possibility, as a career. But you know, I was good and desperate. It was the only school left that was still accepting applications after med school rejected me. So I sent my application in, and then they asked, they gave me an interview. And it was an elderly man, and I was, you know, I was reading the magazines, the women's magazines. And he asked me to come in, and he's like, you are a unique applicant. And, and I was really scared, because people, this is a tough school to get into. People have been working for years with their resumes and, you know, building up their portfolio of articles. And, you know, I hadn't written an article or anything. And he goes, but you are the only applicant we've had who has a BSc. Everybody else who's come to this school has a BA. Why is that? And I said, well, because I knew all those years ago that if I was going to stand out among all these hundreds of BAs, I would have to do something different. I was going to get a different degree. I was going to get a science degree because I knew that that was the career for me. And he bought it. He goes, wow, that's such forward thinking for someone who wanted to get into journalism school. I said, I know. And so he let me in because he felt that I had this unique knowledge that all the other graduates didn't have, which was science. And I could write science articles and you know, bring the world of science to people. But I didn't, you know, he didn't realize I had no understanding of the subject and I barely passed. <laughs> the, you know, the medical school board was, you know, this is a very iffy candidate. <laughs> There's no way she'll ever be allowed to get into medical school. But once I was in journalism school, things changed for me and blossomed. And I realized I could tell story and talk to people about their lives and, and make people laugh. And it was so interesting because I never had that opportunity before. And I did really well in journalism school. And you know who my teacher was in radio broadcast? The late Stuart McLean. It's so nice to talk to an audience who knows who that is. <laughs> you don't know who that is? Have you heard of Jean Gomeshi? So he was the Jean Gomeshi of his time, but without the weird sexual stuff, at least the stuff that we know of, right? That's how I explain it to high school students. He was on CBC Radio, and he, the Vinyl Cafe, you know what, just Google him. So he was my instructor, and he taught me how to write story, and I won the best documentary in his class. It was called The Changing Rituals of Death, and it was about how funerals were starting to change, and people wanted something more fun and different how, you know, it, it, they wanted their, as their coffin was being lowered in the grave, they wanted like a hand to spring out and wave at people and say goodbye, right? So I was doing a documentary on all these really fun rituals that people wanted for their funerals. And it won the best documentary. So I went to the Telefest Awards with Stuart to get the award, and they were going to take the picture of both of us together, and I could feel this tapping on my shoulder. And it was my mother, and she said, if a picture with you and a white man gets out, we'll never be able to get you married because people will think you're having an affair. <laughs> I had to stand aside, and someone else, I know, right? 
20 years later, when he does his vinyl cafe tours, he comes through Saskatchewan. And I convinced the security guard to go, I told, tell him the story and go, please, I need that picture. It wasn't fair, I never got it 20 years ago. They let me in. There. I sent it to my mother. She said she didn't care anymore because I was married and I was my husband's problem now. So after that, I got an internship with a show called Morningside with Peter Zosky. You guys heard of Peter Zosky? Again, like a Gian Gomeshi, <laughs> but much better, yes. He had one of the highest rated radio shows in the country. So high, even higher than television shows. He, he just made magic on air, the way he could tell stories. I got an internship with him for six months. And that's where I started working. And that's when I started realizing that I, you know, I was a producer. I'd find people for him to interview. I would write the backgrounds or write the questions and then give it to him. And he would make this incredible magic on air. And I felt like something was missing inside of me, that I wasn't being cre creatively fulfilled. And he was. And so I realized maybe I should have gone, because I went into the arts but not knowing what all the different branches was. And I thought probably I should have gone into filmmaking but you know, now I've, now I've got two university degrees. I don't want to now go and have the third one. And a friend of mine said, well, don't go to film school. Just, you know, it's like plumbing. It's, it's a trade. You can learn by doing. So go, I, take a, I take, take a course, a three-week summer workshop at the Ontario College of Art, and find out within three weeks if you have what it takes to make, to make films. So I took that course. It was a three-week summer course. You were put in groups of five. One of you is the writer-director, and the other four become your crew, right? You're a camera person, you're a sound person, you're a boom person. And I was thinking, what could I make a film about? It was, I believe, 1995. And while I was thinking, there was a big explosion in Oklahoma. The federal building, the Alfred P. Murray building, exploded. Over 165 people were killed. It was the biggest domestic terrorism incident in the United States up until that point. And so they were arrest arresting all these Muslims. Two or three days later, they arrested Timothy McVeigh, who was a disgruntled member of, he was um, a veteran of the army. He belonged to a white supremacist group, and he was very, very angry with the US government for mishandling the Waco siege years before. And he was trying to bring down the American government. So he was trying to decide between assassinating members of the American government versus destroying a federal building and killing people in it to try to bring down the government. And he had a truck, um, a bomb-laden truck, driven into this building, which at the time had daycare with children. And he said he didn't know, but he didn't regret it because it was a political act and he was arrested. And I was thinking to myself, so in the newspapers, the stereotypes of Muslims and terrorism was so strong that all the attention was being um, set here, yet there was this other movement in the United States, this sort of right-wing, growing right-wing racist movement that was very angry in the government, very political, and trying to destroy the government. And I thought, wow, isn't that interesting how stereotypes can almost blind us to who we look at as suspects? So I thought, how do you make that into a film? So I made a film called Barbecue Muslims, and it was about a barbecue that uh, blows up in the backyard of two Muslim brothers who are sleeping one night. And the police come, and they arrest them, and they accuse them of being Middle Eastern terrorists there to destroy the community. Meanwhile, the real perpetrators were a barbecue anti-resistant front, and they're against barbecues because they're creating carbon pollution in the environment. So they were like global act, you know, climate change act activists, a little bit ahead of their time, because this was 1995. And they were trying to make a point you know, about climate change in 1995 by blowing up people's back, you know, barbecues in their backyards to bring attention to their cause. But the trouble was, they accidentally blew up a Muslim person's barbecue, and now they arrested the Muslims, and no one was att paying attention to them. So they were like picketing in front of the police station saying it was us, we are the real terrorists, arrest us, and no one's paying attention to them. And then they're arguing, why, why would you blow up a Muslim's barbecue? And they're like, we don't know what faith groups owns the barbecues. Barbecues are ecumenically neutral, they're just outside in people's backyards, we don't know if a Jew owns them, or a Hindu owns them, or a Muslim owns them, or a Christian. They don't label them with crosses and stars of David and you know things, they just don't, they just have them, and so we blow them up. And everything was fine until now, until we picked the Muslims by accident, and so they're protesting. And so I made a, uh, I used my brother and I shot this in my parents' house and convinced my neighborhood to be actors. So you can see there's the, the real terrorists up there arguing. 
Then you see my brother and his friends looking at this big hole in the ground going, <laughs> you know, who would put a hole in the ground? And then these are the two pictures I drew of the, of the this is what, and the Toronto, the Toronto Star had pictures of Muslims that look exactly like that all across the front cover as Muslims were being removed from air, airports and airplanes as suspects. So I, I of course, you know, this, this had really shoddy, shoddy production value, as you can well imagine, but I thought it deserved an Oscar. <laughs> so I submitted it to the Toronto International Film Festival. <laughs> a couple of months later, I get a very, you know, irate phone call from the programmer going, listen, there are people out there who are gonna be really, really upset you know, people who have spent years perfecting their film degree, making perf technically perfect films, then there's you <laughs> and this thing. But we cannot deny that there's no one who's doing satires about Muslims and terrorism. And so we have to program you because it's just too original. And then to make it a, a comedy to boot. And it was interesting because I didn't realize it was a comedy. I thought I was making a very serious social, you know, <laughs> commentary on life, but when people, but the, I think the actors had figured it out. And so they were, they were acting, some of them were ad-libbing the lines and adding more stuff. And so it came across, people were laughing in the audience and it really surprised me. And that's when I realized, oh my God, I can take a very serious subject out there in the world and then distill it down to its essence and make a satire and make people laugh. And then they would think, why am I laughing about this? And it broke down people's barriers and their guards because then they were willing to have the conversation about stereotypes and how we view people of color. So I started, but so the Toronto Film Festival said to me, listen, we gave you this one chance, but we're not gonna continue to do this for you. Get money, hire real actors, hire a real crew, and give us a product that looks better. But once you get into the Toronto International Film Festival, that's your calling card film, which means you can now apply for grant money. And back in those days when there was no HD video, it was all like actual film. And film is very expensive to purchase and then to process. It, I had to raise $30,000 to make a 20 minute film for my next project, but that's how much it costs at the bare minimum. But I was able to use that and I made a film called Death Threat. And it, 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 back then in the media, it was always about Muslims and some horrible story. And I think back then it was about Salman Rushdie and Iran. Have you guys heard of him? Okay, good. <laughs> so, just making sure. I'm not going to pick on these two guys, right? So it was, you know, about how Muslims are always threatening writers with death and fatwas, and it's only the Muslims, and you know, it was very focused on the community. So I thought, you know, it would be so interesting to make a, a comedy about a Muslim woman who writes a really schlocky novel, like terrible, like really badly written, but she can't get it published. So she decides to use you know, the stereotypes about her community on purpose to attract a publisher. So she decides, why should Salman Rushdie and all these guys you know, make tons of money? I want a death threat too. <laughs> right? The death threat is your shortcut to fame. So she goes out and she goes, well, how does one do this? Well, you upset Muslims. So she goes to the mosque, starts vandalizing it and breaking everything. And the poor Muslims are like hiring a psychiatrist, trying to get her some medical attention, going, what's wrong? You seem distressed. How, what can we do to help you? And she's like, you know what? I need a shortcut. These guys are just, you know, they're not getting angry enough. And she goes, I need to find some really angry Muslims. So she's reading the newspaper and she realizes the Hamas are coming to town to do a lecture at a university, only men invited. She goes, my God, that's perfect. So she dresses up in a niqab and she, you know, types out her death threat. She's worth about two, three million dollars. She just needs someone authentic to sign it. She goes to the university. It turns out there's a poster on the wall and she had misread it. It wasn't the Hamas, it was a cooking class for hummus. <laughs> but she says, but you know, she's there, she's got her death threat. And then the chickpea delivery guy comes and he goes, who's gonna sign for my, for my chickpeas? So she pays him off in cash and she gets him to sign the death threat. And then she delivers the chickpeas, sends it to the media who of course go completely nuts, going local, you know, homeless cook <laughs> decides to send his woman who wanted to invade his all male class, you know, to death <laughs> for upsetting the men and poof, she gets the attention. So that was my second film. It's called Death Threat. And then, so that got programmed. So now that what got programmed into the International Film Festival. 
So then I started making lots of kooky films. It was a random check, but a young man who's on his way to his wedding, he has to go through you know, international customs. And he had, um, his friend had played a joke on him. He had taken his pop bottles and, and um, shaken them and put them in his suitcase so they could hear a hissing sound. So they thought, <laughs> and when they opened it, it exploded. So they, they put him in jail. Um, and, he, and he's you know, going to be shipped to Guantanamo Bay. And he's trying to explain to his fiance how he's going to be late. <laughs> and she thinks he's getting cold feet, right? Because who has excuses like this? <laughs> and the only way out of jail, he's with a, he's with a I, had read, I had watched a documentary about if you inject too many drugs in your arm, you can actually lose your arm. So he's with a, um, an, a one-armed prisoner who had spent too much time, you know. And so a documentary film crew comes to see the conditions of the jail in Canada because, you know, we care deeply about the conditions of the jails. and. He starts to pretend he's a real terrorist. He goes, they're not feeding us properly in the jails. I had to eat his arm for extra nutrition, right? And then, of course, the prison services food guy who's in charge of this is watching the documentary going, oh, how dare my reputation be besmirched in this way? I feed them steak and you know, shrimp, and he, you know, in a Canadian way, launches in an inquiry <laughs> into the situation. And that's how he got out. So I did that film, and then I did the whole issue about the niqab, which has been in the media, about a young man who holds up 7-Elevens. He's got a loan shark after him, and he needs money very quickly. And he puts on his nylon on his head, and it rips. And he's like, oh no, like, how am I going to take, you know, the loan shark is coming in five minutes, and my, my mask is gone. But luckily for him, his next door neighbor is hanging a pair of niqab to drive. And he goes, oh my god, burqas and niqabs. Like, who could invent a better disguise for holding up 7-Elevens? So when she goes inside, he grabs her niqab and her burqa and runs off to 7-Eleven, trying to hold it up for money. And of course, it's you know a young Indian man who's seeing this very beautiful, agitated woman who must be wanting to propose marriage to him. And he's like, I accept, I accept. And he's like, he realizes he can't get money from the 7-Eleven and runs off and leaves his flip-flop behind. And he chases her and finds the loan shark waiting for attacking his fiance. So, you know, it was a comedy about Nick Abs and getting saved. So anyway, the people who rescued me from making these films was the National Film Board of Canada. They were like, you know, we know you can do kooky things. We know you can do these sort of things, but let's, let's do something more serious about things that matter to you in your life. I had moved to Saskatchewan, and in that time period where the mosques, men and women prayed together in one space, we had an imam come from Saudi Arabia, and at that time, there was sort of this puritanical strain going through about, it had nothing to do with faith, it had more to, something to do with culture, about how men and women, because in their culture, are very separated. And he wanted us to pray behind a curtain, the women behind a curtain. And I was arguing with him going, well, during the time of the prophet in the seventh century, men and women prayed in the same area, and men and women could hear each other speak, and they talked to each other about their concerns and their needs. And now we can't, if you put us behind a curtain, we can't hear you and they can't see us and it creates this artificial boundary. And it's not root, this sort of separation between men and women is not rooted in our faith. And I couldn't convince people that tradition had been mistaken for theology. So I decided the best thing to do was make a documentary where I interviewed you know, famous scholars of Stark Swaidan across the Muslim world and say, listen, what does Islam really say when it comes to men and women and our prayer spaces and our interaction with one another? And they were all, you know, all on board saying, no, there is no such thing as this curtain and the separation. This has come out across over centuries. And we have, as Muslims, we need to talk about it. Patriarchy and misogyny is in everyone's tradition and culture, and we all must talk about it in order to eradicate it from our communities. So I made a documentary called Me in the Mosque, and it was for the National Film Board of Canada. And they sent me to the Banff Television Festival to where the documentary was going to be launched. And, I, and you know, it, I was supposed to be there for three days, and I was talking to a friend of mine. I said, well, what do you do after you finish talking about the documentary? And she goes, well, traditionally, that's where people go to pitch TV shows. So I thought, OK. Well, I don't know anything about television, but I don't want to waste three days in Banff. Um, I, you know, a friend of mine sent me a template of how you write a TV show, the log line and the main characters. And so this documentary was in my mind. And I thought, what would happen if an imam was born and raised here with the same sort of culture and understanding of the women and young people? And he was the imam. How would that change sort of the culture of the mosque community? And so the idea of Little Mosque and Prairie came out of this documentary. And so I wrote it all up, and I started pitching it. And the weird thing was that 
I didn't really intend to make a TV show. I wasn't really taking it very seriously. It was just sort of a thing to do so I wasn't wasting my time there. But everybody else was taking it very seriously. And the CBC was like, you know what? Islam and Muslims are in the zeitgeist and you have captured a way of distilling it and making it into something that's accessible for people. Let's go into production. And even then I didn't take it seriously because back in those days, CBC, like even Canada, we weren't known for sitcoms. It was just in, there was just a general sense the Americans could do sitcoms, but as Canadians, we just couldn't do it. We had never had success. You know, the only things we had had up to then was King of Kensington and Beachcombers. Those are two shows <laughs> that existed a long time ago. Right? <laughs> Have you guys heard of those shows? Yeah. yeah, that was it. We couldn't come up with anything. And there was just this feeling that we couldn't do it, that the Americans could do it. And thus, it was very hard for Canadians to watch Canadian shows because we live, we, I think we are the only English culture, because, because we are, you know, we jut against them. Everybody watches American shows and thus it's hard for us to have a Canadian television industry because we don't have the millions and millions of ad dollars that they do to get, you know, eyeballs watching our shows. But when the media found out that the CBC was working on a show, a, not just a show about Muslims, but a comedy about Muslims, and not just a comedy about Muslims, but a comedy set in a mosque. You can just imagine, right? If I fall, just catch me. <laughs> and so people were like, oh no, like they're gonna, Muslims are gonna riot, they're gonna blow up the CBC, they're gonna blow up the you know, cars, like this is terrible, what is CBC doing? They're out of their minds, this is suicide. And so the New York Times and CNN and Al Jazeera, everyone started doing stories on us and this crazy project that the CBC was doing. But what it was doing for us was it was getting us, buying us ads that we couldn't buy. There's no way we could have afforded that much ad revenue to have gotten that much attention. So the fear of Islam and Muslims and comedy was enough to get all this attention. And so by the time we aired, we aired to record ratings. Like the CBC hadn't had uh, ratings like that since Anne of Green Gables, like 20 years previous. So it was this massive success and it went across the country. And then, then what was really interesting was that the Europeans started paying attention. And they were like, what is this show? And I started getting all these interviews from European journalists. But I had made this television series to talk about patriarchy and misogyny and, and how we as a community were fighting it and you know, reliving our faith authentically. But they weren't interested in that. What they were interested in was that there was a mosque in a church in a little town of Saskatchewan and there were white people and brown people and black people living together in a community. You know, true they had fights but they were still living together. And that was something that they found really foreign. That's when I started doing research and realizing that the history of immigration that my parents had experienced was very different than the history of immigration that the Europeans had experienced. And that, for example, in Germany, they had invited the Turks to come in and help rebuild their community after World War II, but they didn't want them to stay. So there was no offer of citizenship or of a job or of living in the city. So when my father came from England to Canada, there was offer of citizenship, live in the city with his neighbors, and a job. Those were three things that they were like, they were not going to give. And they kept the Turks on the outskirts of the city so they could leave, they could, out of sight, out of mind. They were considered temporary workers, never to be assimilated and be part of their culture or community. Because they thought after maybe 10 years they would leave, but these jobs took generations. So then their children were born without citizenship. Without citizenship, they had no access to higher education and they couldn't vote or participate in the community. So ghettos and third world, you know, world community started as being established around the periphery of Germany of Turkish citizens. And so then this hatred of the two communities started. And it started this division and feeling of that, you know, these people just don't want to fit in, they want to assimilate, they want to be part of us. But there had never been any multicultural policy in place to make them or allow them a chance for upward mobility. So if someone like me had been born in a place like France or Germany, I never would have been allowed to, say, dress the way I do, have the jobs that I do, have the opportunities that I do, because it would have been considered too alien they're changing our ways and we have to be pure and our language has to be pure and our culture has to be pure and they're gonna come in and they're gonna change us. Whereas Canada, it was all about coming in, 
being part of the community, change was good, being assimilated, making sure the kids got citizenship, making sure that there were jobs available, making sure that there was integration. We had reasonable accommodation for faith. So if I wanted to wear hijab in school, I could do it. I could pray at school. I could go to the mosque. If I was in France and I wanted to wear hijab, they would actually remove me from school. The laws are such in France that Muslim girls can't wear hijab because it's considered you know, infringement on the culture. So all these girls, then what they do is they either take their scarf off or they refuse to take it off and are kicked out. And if they refuse, and if they, even if they take it off and they're wearing long skirts, like a maxi skirt, because it's fashionable, they're removed from school because that smacks too much of Islam, because as if modesty is only an Islamic value. And so then some of them just go underground to schools, you know, that are private or you know, that are not as good for them. And to me, that, you know, there's not a lot of difference between, say, the Taliban who are preventing girls from going to school or French secular policy that do the same thing, but in the name of secularism. If girls can't get an education, it's bad for everyone, no matter which country you come from. And so what they were watching this show, and they were realizing that Canada had a multicultural policy in place, and that if you looked at the employment levels of Muslims and the education level of Muslims, they were on par with their non-Muslim neighbors. But if you look in Europe, the employment level and poverty level um, is at its lowest, and the highest crime levels are the highest with Muslims. And they had blamed it because they're Muslim, that's why. But yet there's this whole other world and a whole other cultural experiment going on in Canada and the United States where that wasn't happening. And it was because of the complicated reasons of migration and the way we treat people when they come into our country and how, you know, what we give them so they can survive and do well and thrive as a community, which was missing from Europe. And they were looking at that show for those reasons. And that really, really surprised me because I had never considered that before, that plurality takes effort and takes policy, and that governments sometimes have to have policies in place and say, this is how it's going to be, so that, so that communities can survive and thrive and do really well. And now that we live in this time period, we see nationalism starting to come up, even in the countries that we live in here in Canada and the United States, and that President Trump is starting to stoke those fears about our differences and about whether or not we can really live together as people, and if that's possible. And it scares me because it's not the experiment that we live in in Canada. That's a tough experiment to do successfully. Not a lot of people and cultures have been able to do that. India used to be able to do that, but it, it took like how long to end that? you know, feeling of people living as neighbors. Rwanda had that, gone, you know? Yugoslavia had that, gone. It can vanish, and when it vanishes, the results are catastrophic. You can destroy your society. People can turn against each other in a heartbeat. People you thought were your neighbors and loved you, it can be taught that fear is something that, that's gonna take over if you let the immigrants in. And I ha CNN called me recently, and they said, did you know that there was a study done on Little Mosque on the Prairie? and they had two control groups. They showed one control group, three episodes of Little Mosque on the Prairie, and the other control group, the sitcom Friends. And then they measured, they did a baseline measure of racism and how they felt about Muslims, and then they did a, a measurement afterwards. And the, the group that watched Little Mosque on the Prairie, their attitude towards Muslims became more favorable. The group that watched Friends, the attitude stayed the same. So what this told me was that popular culture has a very, very powerful influence on our perceptions of a community. Because sometimes you live in a place where, and this is human nature, you want to be around people that you know and you're familiar with, that you share culture and language and faith, and sometimes the only way you see a, a community that's different from you, particularly one that's smaller or marginalized, is on the screens. And prior to the little mosque on the prairie, the only Muslim you would have ever been exposed to was the Muslim in the news, the terrorist. And that becomes the only Muslim you will ever know or hear about, which means it skews your whole opinion about an entire group of people, and you view them only as the threatening other. But, that, but this is why we need diversity in television and diversity in our culture, in our, in our pop culture, because without that diversity, people's opinions and attitudes become very skewed and dangerous towards other groups, and that allows people to fear monger and be able to do things to entire communities wholesale, including slaughter and death, because people believe they're scary. And I think, you know, when we watch President Trump, we hear those, the same language happening. They're, those rapists, those people, they're gonna take our jobs, they're gonna take our land, they're gonna destroy what's great about America. That's the same message that's been going on for centuries. And that's the same message that's used to divide people. 
and destroying entire cultures and societies. And it, we are starting to hear some of those messages again. And so the, that's the one message I want to get out is the only way we can really have a true pluralistic society is to get to know one another, to know our neighbors, and to talk to each other, and to watch and read and consume art from other people, because that is the way that you will understand other people. And when I made Little Mosque on the Prairie, what was really surprising was that I thought I came from the wackiest you know, community in the world. Nobody is as nutty as Muslims. And then when people watched it, they were like, you know what? We had the same argument and fight at our soccer association last week, or at our church potluck, right? Or at the temple. And, and they would top my stories that I came up with on the show. And what they were telling me was that every, when you have groups of human beings, it doesn't matter what color or religion or society you belong to, everyone more or less acts the same. You get the same stereotypes, right? The rebellious teenager, you know, the matriarch, the patriarch who wants to control everybody, who thinks he knows more, the misogynist. I mean, you have all these characters, but they're archetypes for a reason because they exist in all our communities. And so we're all fighting and, and being angry with each other and mistrusting each other, and yet essentially we're all the same people do, doing the same things and having the same goals. We want to you know, get married, have a partner, have kids, have a job, have a purpose in life, be secure, and just be happy and live in peace. Every single one of us wants the exact same thing. And so fighting with each other isn't going to get us those things, but working with each other will help us all live in peace and prosperity and have a better world. <laughs> <laughs>